and hello and welcome to another episode of a loose cannon uh this week we are going to be talking all about the um previous season's lore book acts of mercy uh we had a big gap there so we're, we're playing a little bit of catch up but it's a pretty good book um and this season's really good. It's 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 a bit of a short book as well, which is actually nice because that gives us uh, freedom to talk about the season and all that. And so um, let's actually start with that. Uh, last time we spoke, I think we had just finished Crow, uh, Crow's Sever Missions. Yeah. And so that was really good. Having Crow like go through the 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 motions of dealing with his past self like actually finally dealing with the fact that he is risen from Aldrin. He's not Aldrin, but he's risen from, from Aldrin. And um we also had Zavala with Safi and his his guilt and Safi. <laughs> that's what he calls her, right? He calls her Safi. Yeah. Sophia, yeah. Cause I is it Sophia? Yeah. I I, I I couldn't remember if it was like Sophia or Safaya or you know I didn't want to. Well, it's spelled the... so it's spelled so different. You mm. would you, that was my first instinct is to try to pronounce it a different way, but then when he said it in game, uh, okay, so he does say it. it in game. I I, yeah. I must have missed that because I was I called her he called her Safi. I'm just gonna call her Safi because first off, it's easier to say Safi, and yeah, <laughs> I try not to pronounce <laughs> things wrong. I try to pronounce them correctly in the first yeah. place. So, um, Safi Sophia, uh, that was also good. And then this week we've got, um, Keitel who is facing off yeah. against Gaul. Uh, so yeah. what, what was your general, uh, take on all of these, these initial sever missions and the later two for Zavala and Crow? <sighs> wow. Trauma, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's almost like they're going through some forced, uh, therapy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, they they very much these. are. Yeah. Well, it, it, and what's funny is um, the theory, the the therapy that they're experiencing um, is more like a sub submersion <laughs> therapy. They're being submerged with their their guilt and fear to have mm -hmm. to overcome it. This mm -hmm. is the only way to deal with the things that they're having the issue with is head on. Um, which, if you think about it, had it not been for the nightmares. They probably I was never would say that. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's almost it's almost like because uh I know Savathun did it going into Witch Queen when she lost in the in the final in the final bit where she she didn't get her way and we kind of outsmarted yeah. her like in um we outsmarted her in season of the splicer, right? And then so going into season of the lost she was all like, look at all these good things I did for you. Like, I've been helping you this whole time. I brought Crow into your fold. And, and it was like, yeah, but you were trying to fuck us up. We just right. beat you. Yeah. And and part of me is like, is the darkness kind of doing the same thing here? Like, is it like, yeah. look at these good things I did for you. And it's like, but you were trying to fuck us up. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the, <laughs> the motives behind yeah. it, it's like. You really think we're that dumb, you know, or, uh, you know, I don't know. Sometimes I, it's easier to, to trick people. Yeah. Sometimes it's easier to trick people head on. Yeah. Than it is to try to be like uber deceitful. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and so it, it's very forceful and Crow really needed this. Like this, this was, this was necessary for Crow. Zavala. Yeah. In my opinion, Zavala's like trauma of of guilt having an adopted son and all that, having an ex wife. I mean, it was really awesome. I love getting more information on Zavala, but it did feel kind of like out of left field. Like Zavala, from my opinion, previously, his foundation was shook and shaken, shook, shook and shaken, whichever it is, shooketh. shaken, shooketh. not stirred. Uh, his foundation was shaken out stirred back when like the traveler failed to save them right. and, and all these other things. So throwing in ex-wife and, and dead son, it's like, Oh, oh okay. <laughs> kind of just yeah. like hit me weird. And, and Keitel, I'm very excited for Keitel to overcome uh, hers because her whole thing is like, is she just the next in the line 
of another failed cabal empire leader, like from Cadmus right. to Gaul to her. Right. And what's the, it's the ring of spears and the Queens and, mm -hmm. you know, are the, all the stars are starting to align. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the past, uh, leadership of all the different factions have kind of failed to, you know, be the herald of the end. And, and here we are with all of these new representatives trying to, uh, okay, where do we go from here? They've all got this. I mean, the fallen were the first ones that we were able to experience um, that had really no, you know, like one central figure anymore because they had, you know, they had just a failed um, whatever, you know, their collapse, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And the then, um, yeah, the whirlwind, sorry. <laughs> I was trying to remember the name of it. So they had the whirlwind and that gave us a window into... Um, what could ultimately happen to us. And then as we've gone through out the, the game, we've witnessed now the hive mm -hmm. and the cabal. Mm -hmm. And so where does that leave us? I mean, we saw, we saw the Vex, you know, with Atheon and, and, and their uh, d fragmented uh, factions as well. Inner factions uh, kind of not really, but they, they don't really have a good way of, uh, overcoming the darkness either so the, yeah we've all hit a wall now <laughs> yeah it, it is actually interesting because the fallen's whirlwind uh oryx was there and the pyramids were there we have uh, uh i think it was varix who confirmed seeing the pyramids in the sky uh and then the traveler like booked it and so when our collapse came i think savathun was here she was here representing the pyramids and and the cabal they had zivu arath so fallen had oryx we had savathun cabal had zivu arath and it's like that's oh wow it's just like this weird like wow like really stars aligned yeah and i don't think there's any like importance to it but it's just funny how that worked out yeah well yeah and, and you know there's a lot of inter interconnectedness within the story too mm -hmm. Sophia's story is a new one, um, or a yeah. new writer at Bungie. Uh, yeah, I saw it. And, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I wanna, I wanna shout them out, and I, I cannot remember the name. Can you remember the name? So sorry, at the moment I can't remember either. Uh, you you yeah. talk, and I'll find it. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> it makes sense that it's um, unlike anything we've ever heard and doesn't fit the cadence of what we've experienced so far uh, story-wise and there and there in the narrative uh, lore mm -hmm. because uh, this writer really kind of took it to um, a new level, which is great because we'd never really heard um, any kind of inner dialogue with Zavala as far as his past mm -hmm. is concerned or any kind of, what was Zavala like as he was learning and growing and becoming the man he is today? Yeah. Except for um, that, uh, that D2 launch trailer where we should yeah. see Zavala like rise up and they completely skip over it. They go right to the city. Exactly. They completely skip over all this, all this stuff where he had a wife and kid. Yeah. And, and he's just suddenly there. I mean, he's yeah. coming out of a crash ship. Like I want to know mm -hmm. so much about all of that. Right. Mm -hmm. And the drifter walks by in that one cutscene. I don't think it was the drifter. Wasn't it confirmed not to be the drifter? It was. Uh, they, never um, they never confirmed it. Let me. Let me hear. You. I'll be right back. Okay. Good. Uh. <laughs> but yeah, it's nice to see that um, Zavala has some story that can kind of go off, um, mm. and explain some of the reasons as to why he's so you know headstrong and and forthright with his convictions yeah uh so um, i don't know uh so really quick before before we get off track from it the uh the the author of the book triage which is heavily featuring the zavala uh safi story um you get the little snippet and that's kind of like what this book that we're talking about today acts of mercy you get a little bit of their history but if you really want to get the details you have the full book triage which right. was written by uh, Dr. Hazel, uh, as they are on, on Twitter. Uh, they're at Hazel Mon Fortun. Uh, it's spelt like it sounds, Mon Fortun. Uh, 
I'm sure it's pronounced very differently. I'm just trying to give it so you can uh, follow them if you're interested. I posted it in the chat uh, as well. Dr. Hazel uh, wrote this book. It was their first book at Bungie. And whenever there's a new writer, I'm very excited. I think I actually mentioned this on a previous show. Whenever there's a new writer, I'm very excited because they have such a fresh take on things. And that's how you get characters like Safi. Like you have Zavala who has this like gap in their history and it takes someone new coming in. It's like, who's handling this? And it's like, no one's handling that. And they're like, well, I guess I'm handling it. And it's like, we get this, this new take on, um, on Zavala, which is very exciting. Um, but so for the person that Zavalis passes in the city, I'm pretty sure it's uh, one of Cade's six, as I can hold up on the camera here. Uh, <laughs> that man is, uh, as Cade says, my main man, Jin. He's a survivor, no joke. Washed the red off his hands and hung his gun sometime back, but I don't know how many who survived. Worse before, he made his way to the city. So... It it sounds plausible, and they look very similar. <laughs> they look like him and the Drifter with with three D art and stuff. It's very possible that he could have um, he could be the man uh, Zavala walked past. Yeah did did we ever have we never had anything where Cade explicitly talked to the Drifter, did we? I feel like we did, but I can't remember it off the top of my head. Mm. Because Cade died, and then the Drifters showed up in in right. game timeline, so they they wouldn't really have a direct interaction in game. But right. I'm, I mean, I'm sure they ran they ran in similar circles of like desperado outlaw type. But, That's uh, funny. So, so this week we had Keitel's, uh, sever and Keitel rebuked, uh, turned away from Eris calling her hive, witch, and, and she didn't need any hive magic. So she wasn't bound to the, um, the little staffy thing. And because of that, we had a very different ending to sever because normally in sever, like crow was haunted by Aldrin. And the nightmare that spawned was the nightmare of Thickroll. And Zavala was haunted by Safi, and the nightmare that spawned was a fallen. And Keitel is haunted by Gaul, and so she's facing off with the Gaul nightmare. And then we are fighting a separate Gaul nightmare in the fight. Because she yeah. wasn't strong enough to do it herself, I guess. Yeah. So... Huh. That was the first time, and I guess that's because she wasn't actually tied to the hive magic. And and so obviously next week, or actually, I don't even know. It would be really interesting if next week we fight alongside Keitel, because now we actually have Keitel fight animations thanks to the dungeon. Like, could they could they have programmed her as an NPC that we fight alongside? Yeah, that'd be cool. That would be cool. That would be pretty cool. As long as she's stronger than the other cabal that tried to help us. <laughs> yeah, the two guys <laughs> that run that we run in with, and they just see the fan and like, well, I guess we're stuck. <laughs> Not going any further today. Yeah, I try to save him at that one point every time. I try to shoot a rocket way down from way up high. Mm -hmm. I try to shoot a rocket way down at those two ogres coming out from under the bridge where the on that one um what is that thing called the um oh are you, you know, talking the about mission? in the in the the mission yeah you can save those guys yeah i'd try so hard i try a, to shoot a, a rocket zone. yeah it's because it, awesome. all they had to do was wait another minute and they'd be alive but they just like ran <laughs> right to their death i know man cabal mentalities are weird yeah to the death they don't have any what was the thing they don't have a word for retreat, retreat or whatever. Yeah. yeah yeah they don't have a word for retreat and then literally 5 minutes after we learn that fact we have the text that they were treated <laughs> so that was when we were fighting um well they had various names like That's mario funny. and luigi blastoise and charizard yeah yeah 
I hated it when because there was like there was like one name they like named one Charizard and then they named the other. It was like not another Pokemon. I'm like, just keep it in the same realm. I don't care what you call it's them so as funny. long as they as long as they're from the same genre, the same IP. Call them whatever the hell you want. <laughs> <laughs> Have you, I I have actually gotten into the dungeon. Have you gotten into the dungeon yourself yet? No, no, I don't, I have no desire to do that at the moment. Mm. It's a fun one. It's, 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 yeah, it looks, it looks insane. (laughs) Yeah. It's not as bad as it might look. It's, it's because there's like a lot of flipping. So it looks like it's, it's, it's more than it is. But I mean, especially with me. I was basically just put on like ad duty. It's like, okay, this hang out here. You're going to look for these guys. You're just going to kill right. these guys. And that's basically your job. And just like right. every raid, just like every dungeon, it basically has like two or three mechanics and you learn those mechanics. And the only thing that changes is where you go to perform those mechanics. And um, so, I mean, I think it's, I'm confident I can learn uh, the more runner positions, but most of mine was just hanging around um really good loot from it and i did not get the the story the little lore bits i did not get those but when i go through i'm i'm um i'm gonna try to record and upload and see if i can get something for the show and maybe we can do uh, a run through and i'll have like video snippets and i can give it to you separately yeah uh so we can play video snippets on on the show here and so people listening people watching can view them can listen to them um and we can we can go through that but the dungeon's pretty interesting because you fight the nightmare of uh Keitel and you fight nightmares of Galron I think they're actually I'm not even sure if they're actually Galron or if they're just bathers but you you know you basically fight the Galron uh whatever they were called the baby Galrons that you fought before you fought <laughs> the actual Galron right they really got the workout of Galron in this game <laughs> He's almost as used hard as uh, as Tanix is. That's funny. And um, you know, you're going down there, and it's 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 all of uh, Callus's regrets. And Callus has a lot of interesting. You actually came to me with uh, a theory about Callus, and it it makes more and more sense the more you think about it. What was it? Well, I mean, it's your theory. I was I was. <laughs> I don't you. remember. I have so many theories. <laughs> <laughs> you were telling me how you think Callus is is the uh, egregore. Oh, that yeah. He's spreading across, and I don't necessarily agree that he's the egregore, but I think that he's within like his powers are the the egregore. That yeah. he is he is through the egregore spreading himself. Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, it would make sense, kind of like an infection, right? Yeah. And. So that's kind of where I got with that, but he can, he can, he can, <clears throat> he can somehow use that part of the um, egregore to uh, spread himself throughout the ship and whatnot. We were talking about, mm-hmm. um, remember we were talking about Oryx throwing his throne world inside out and making the ship, the dreadnought yeah. and yada, mm-hmm. yada. And how, that's kind of where that stemmed from was how Callus is now has his Leviathan ship infected with the egregore. Mm-hmm. And so you hear his rumblings all throughout the ship where he really seems like he is the ship now. Yeah. Um, and he, he talks and so, about stuff like that, how he feels us battling across him yeah. across his flesh. And so it's like really fucking disgusting. It is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, you know, like Savathan's, uh, throne world mm-hmm. was was pretty wild too like mm. she and then you get into the mind of Savathun, which was even stranger than anything but so i guess what i'm saying is there seems to be like a revol- <laughs> a reoccurring theme of sorts yeah there is well um yeah i i, I look for and it makes sense to me at the very least, that Callus is in some way controlling the Egregore, because you, you specifically mentioned that you questioned if the Egregore was mentioned uh, before we went on to the ship, like in uh, Katavasis's, uh, captain in the Captain's Log lore book, if he mentioned the Egregore. 
And I don't recall him specifically mentioning the egregore, but he did mention that the crown of sorrow was tarnishing. So it sounded like it was beginning yeah. to, to spread, but it didn't really yeah. take over. And I remember this. And so, so it's, I think there is merit to it that Callus well, is controlling. Okay. So we got, so in the season of the hunt is where mm -hmm. this started. And we got specific pieces or items. Bungie loves to plant seeds that pay mm -hmm. off a year later or so. Yeah. And we got we got a few items in game that really didn't line up with the story that we were being taught uh, in Season of the Hunt. Season of the Hunt was Crow's back, mm -hmm. and um, you know he was trapped by um, Spider, and we had Zivu Arath's uh, baddies to 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 fight. And remember their little trees that mm -hmm. we had to like you know extinguish and whatnot so in that some things came up that was the lichen mm -hmm. and how the baddies were rooting themselves into the ground yeah. and they were you know spreading tendrils on, off their backs and you know one of them one of the one of the baddies took out a tendril and stabbed it in the ground and it just seemed to grow on its own uh, yeah those were so the, that um, the for people who don't remember those were like the um kind of like mutant horn that stood like 20 feet tall those spires yeah. that would that would spawn you'd run up to it and you would um you'd basically plant the same thing that we're using now actually yep you'd yep, plant exactly. it into the roots and then you'd summon yep. the wrathborn holy shit yep 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 so it's all full circle that's what i'm saying so that particular uh seed was planted way back then and what they were calling it at the time before we ever knew about the egregore was the lichen and mm -hmm. how it would tarnish gold and it would tarnish gold and turn it into this like green color and um it somehow infected precious metals and so we got all of these weapons that yeah. were tarnished gold with green like uh and yeah, that came in you know? that came in season of the chosen you had your weapons like um exactly Duello, which was the the, yes. the rocket launcher that was a big one yes exactly and, and so we were starting to see tarnish show up. Yeah. yeah. And we were starting to see all these weapons show up. And then, you know, here we are now. Uh, and the Egregore is full on here because Katabas is, you know, the whole story with that. Mm -hmm. And the ship came here. So it's really freaky that here we are getting these first inklings of lichen and tarnish. And then all of a sudden we know about the the ship out there. And we go on the ship and we try to save Katabasis yeah. and we find out what it really is. And we learn about the Egregore. Mm -hmm. And then the Egregore is now very much a big part of this whole Leviathan ship and everything. Yeah. And there is just destroyed which, and you have roots going all over the place. Which the, the Leviathan should not have any of the Egregore on it. So that's that's what I think lends the most evidence to Callus is in some fashion controlling the Egregore group. Yes. Because... He he takes the uh, the Glycon Volantis and he dives it into the anomaly that was left behind when Mars was taken, and right. he comes out. He the darkness calls back to him. He he somehow gets the Egregore power. He spreads it across the Glycon, and maybe it's almost like a um uh. I I know there is a thing, and I can't think of it. It's like. Wherever he moves, the egregore kind of like his footfalls, like spread it type of thing. Uh, there's like a oh, media yeah. comparison yeah, that yeah, I want to yeah, draw, yeah. and I can't think of it. And so he leaves the Glycon because the Glycon was clearly a derelict ship. It was drifting out in space. That's when we go on to it. He had already left the Glycon for the Leviathan. Everyone on the Leviathan, I'm not sure if we mentioned this, but everyone on the Leviathan was like, fuck this, and they got the hell out of there. They were yeah. like, we are no longer Callus's <laughs> loyalists. And yeah. he had to grow new Cabal, and they're basically right. dumb Cabal now. They don't have free will. He's he's effectively made organic Taken. And, exactly. And he spread his Egregore out across the Leviathan. I love going back to the Leviathan now and seeing all the Egregore spores and everything. It's yeah. so fucking interesting. And in the dungeon, you don't not only do you have the Egregore, but you also have the like darkness pillars. Remember those darkness pillars that were like in the pyramid in uh Savathun's yeah. throne world and you'd see like the horse statues crawling out yeah. and you didn't oh, really that's know right. what they were. Those right. things are like kind of like littered not necessarily the horse statue parts but those like pillars of like this like weird metal stone thing those are all around the dungeon as well yeah they're just like and the weapons subtle. we got 
the weapons we have are very um, themed around. Mm -hmm. I think they're giving us a clue of what's going to happen because if you look at the new weapons that we're finding on the Leviathan, they have they go from they're in a transitional period where they go from like it's a normal weapon to this like twisted uh, machinery like the the uh, pyramid ships um, you know aesthetic, but it has the color still. And so it just kind of looks like it's being ripped and twisted into the geometric shape that is of the pyramids manipulation, where we, you have to shoot the little things that you were talking about that appear in the sky, and then all of a sudden you have to um, <clears throat> do a, a, what is it, the little spire or whatever that pops up. But those that aesthetic has been put onto these, these guns uh, in particular. Which ones are you pulling up? Uh, so I just got like that, like banner image. Sorry, I had it. I knew there was something I was forgetting to do in in uh-huh. uh, OBS, and I could. I was like, I checked everything except for the one thing that I, it was the problem. So these are the weapons, and um, the like a little banner image, low quality. Sorry about that. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> These are the weapons, and my favorite thing about them is this: it kind of gets lost because of the background. They have uh-huh. this red glow on them, and yes. that is that is uh, native to the weapon. If you put a shader on this weapon, this like kind of pristine silver, if you put a shader on it, the red glow stays. The red glow yeah. goes over the shader, so it. it I mean, fashion is the true end game in Destiny. So it just right. it really allows for interesting things. But not only that, these are some of the best, in my opinion, probably some of the best weapons in the game right so now. So these because... are the weapons, these are the weapons that have like the true nightmare um mm-hmm. influence uh mm-hmm. in imbued inside the weapon. And they have like the more streamlined, sharpened aesthetic to them. But the basic weapons before these that you're picking up here and there as you're playing in the campaign have more Oh, you just mean the, the seasonal weapons? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. But these are the ones that are like what that is becoming is almost what it looks like. So mm-hmm. these are the ones that are more of your osteostriga type of aesthetic, but with yeah. instead of being, you know, the thorny, high, uh, what do you yeah. call it, weapons of sorrow, it has the nightmare aesthetic yeah. to it instead. It's, it's very clean and sharp and dangerous. Yes. Like, like it's very on the surface dangerous. It's, it's almost like, like what you and I were talking about last time we were trying to figure out, well, what color would the next thing be? <laughs> yeah. It almost feels like, uh, you know, like this is what, <laughs> this is almost like what they're trying to say. Instead of a weapon of sorrow, this would be like a mm, weapon of nightmare. I don't mm-hmm. know. You know, mm-hmm. just like a <laughs> counter. Not something weapon. that's not influenced by the hive. It's just like pure, exactly. pure darkness. And yeah. kind of kind of flowing with that because like the darkness is trying to like get us on its side and stuff. So it's gonna give us good weapons because it knows how yeah. guardians operate. So it wants to give us good <laughs> weapons. And so if I remember correctly, the grenade launcher here is a stasis grenade launcher, which means it sits in the, the first slot. Very, very good for a grenade launcher. That's it's that's the kind pog of launcher. For. Yeah. And um <laughs> it has some good rolls. I have no good rolls. This SMG here on the left, um, this one comes with a new perk called Rep- Repulsor Brace, which t- gives you an overshield when you kill an enemy who is debuffed by a void debuff, and it is a void weapon. So it plays hand in hand with Void 3.0 so yeah. amazingly. I'm back on Void Hunter. I made a whole build. Uh, with like bombardiers and i'm just like throwing smoke i'm throwing grenades weakening enemies getting volatile rounds and like it's like it's really good if you can get one with demo demolitionist repulsor brace it's gonna be fucking insane and then you have here the storm tracer the linear fusion that is so broken that it is absolutely going to get nerfed it it fires bursts it's a linear fusion that does like three bursts it goes in one shot and it's it's very fun. It's an arc uh, linear fusion. <sighs> so, of course it's arc. absolutely. Yeah. What, what do you mean? Of course, it's arc. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you have four weapons and you have four uh, subclasses for them to tie them to. No, because I'm pretty sure the the pulse rifle is arc as well. So they would be missing the I solar. It was but solar. That's interesting. Well, let me see now. Oh. Now I'm interested. Maybe you're, maybe I'm wrong. I thought it was solar because I thought I remembered somebody using it. No, the pulse rifle is stasis, 
Oh, so you got two stasis weapons there. Yeah, and then uh, um, it's probably yeah. stasis because they were trying to balance it around things like the Callus Mini Tool, and I'm assuming Drang is is solar as well. I don't because remember. the SMG uh, Unforgiven is Void. Storm Chaser is obviously Arc based on that name. And I cannot find, uh, I cannot recall the name of the, the grenade launcher. So I can't find it easily. I just, right. I just see the pictures of it without its name. Lingering Dread, maybe, is also that stasis. That sounds right. Yeah. That sounds so, right. Yeah, it, it is also stasis. So it's two stasis weapons, one void weapon, and one arc weapon. And as much as I love the Unforgiven SMG, it's a little ridiculous how many arc, or not arc, void SMGs we're getting, where it's like, okay, enough. Like, we need some other ones that are also good. Uh, so, yeah. So, back where we were talking about how we're, we're seeing... Um, the evolution of this mm -hmm. whole egregore zivu arath savathun darkness pyramid mm -hmm. and callus type of thing um you know we were so so i only brought up the the weapons because it feels like um and i know i've said this before but it feels like and i know there's always like those seasonal weapons that are very indicative of the season mm -hmm. But it feels like um, this is just a one more step in the the stairway to the next thing. Because if you look at the seasonal weapons and those particular uh, nightmare imbued weapons that you were just bringing up, mm -hmm. they are almost leaning towards what they kind of want to do next. Um, so yeah, if we get, yeah, so if we get some sort of, uh, uh, you know, you know, new experience, and I guess we don't see anything. We'll Okay, we got to see something in Lightfall around like August or October, right? Some kind of teaser. Well, I mean, if it's going to release in June, maybe maybe even a little later. Or not June, February. Oh. If it's going to release in February, maybe even a little later than August. I mean, you did say hey. October, so probably closer to October, yeah. Yeah, and we have Halloween, you know, we have the, um, the what do you call it, the Season of the Lost, and or Festival of the Lost, and... Mm. Maybe they'll drop another hint in there, and then we'll actually see like a image or a shot of something, you know, closer to the end of the year, and then full on trailer in the new year. Yeah, yeah. Um, what? It doesn't matter. Never mind. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, it's just it's just interesting because remember we were talking about Nezarex Whisper, mm -hmm. which everybody wanted to, you know, like what is that, you know. The Nezarek is here, you know, that whole yeah. thing. Uh, that weapon has the same, you know, aesthetic of the other uh, uh, seasonal weapons. Like, like for instance, Bump in the Night, you know, the rocket launcher, that's the one I think of. Because it's like the biggest one you can think of. It has like that freaky deaky, mm -hmm. twisted and mangled. And it's almost like... It's almost like if you took a regular rocket launcher and started to dip it into a fabric of reality that was twisting it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then uh, the tip of it is just destroyed. Yeah, because Nezarex Whisper, um, Nezarex Whisper, the linear fusion, the auto rifle, uh, and the rocket launcher, they all have this. Um, and I can actually do this one really quick as well. Okay. They all have that kind of like, oh, and. Uh, I think it's a pulse rifle. Um, no, that's the, that's got to be the auto rifle, or is it not an auto? Oh, I was saying a trace rifle. A trace rifle. Oh yeah, there is a trace rifle. Yeah, I think I said linear fusion. I meant trace. Yeah, rifle. it looks like the linear fusion. <laughs> yeah, uh, all of these weapons have like a splash of callus in them, but they also have like this like ribbed, um, kind of riveted, which is very similar to the vow of uh, vow of the disciple raid. Uh, weapons where they have these like turning structures, which yes. is reminiscent of the uh, the ziggurat that came on Europa. Yeah, if you remember there that, you that thing, kind of came in all like transformery. Yeah, yeah there and, you go. Um, so it's almost like that is those weapons with the splash of callus, whereas the duality weapons are like pure darkness. 
Exactly. Or maybe not pure darkness, because I guess the raid weapons would be pure darkness, and well, the duality think, weapons think, are like I darkness. I think your arm was something the, like the aesthetic of the new um, weapons are are matching that, like what would be the darkness weapons. And then just mm-hmm. like what you said, I think it's a perfect uh, explanation for these weapons. Like Callus has taken what he his idea is of the pyramid weapons, put his splashed his gold on it. And you know they're twisted and mangled and kind of beat up because and crude because he's not as like good at it as <laughs> true darkness mm-hmm. would be. Yeah, um, that's that's a good way to like. I guess that's a good way to explain it. All right. Well, so that's kind of it's like where we are in the season, and uh, we have a lot more to cover. So why don't we get into the lore card this week? Sure. So this lore card um, is. So this one is cool because it's tied to a story that was on on the undercurrent of the season, which is Saint and Osiris's kind of like, um, you know, um, I guess embracing moment or Mm -hmm. whatnot. You know, it's kind of like, you know, Osiris has been traumatized and just like he's a frail individual at this point and yeah, saint like is he's there in a coma, to kind of, he might not even live right and so he's he's there and and saint you know is trying to protect him and so everybody in the tower is kind of allowed saint or, or given saint the room to grieve and and deal with this trauma of his love osiris and mm-hmm. he's having to you know he's having to wrestle inside with the you know, he wants to he wants to go charge out into the world and just beat the hell out of and headbutt everything that ever made this happen to Osiris. But at the same yeah. time, he wants to be there with Osiris. Mm-hmm. And uh, so anyway, it, it's really it's really cool because when I first looked at the uh, when I first looked at the item in game, I thought, okay, well this is a a bat wing from Batman because it looks <laughs> like a spaceship. It looks like the bat wing from Batman. <laughs> I see. I can see the the Batman sim, sim, uh, symbol in yeah. there. So I didn't. I mean, I didn't even think like it would have any kind of interesting story or lore to it. But when I read the lore card, I was like, "Wait a minute, what is happening here?" And so, if you look at the ship closely, uh, you can see it, it very much has the Osiris aesthetic, but it also has Saint Fourteen aesthetic mm-hmm. with his ribbons that are tailed off on the side, and it has. It has the very Egyptian motif that goes mm-hmm. with all the trials stuff because this is a trial ship, technically, I guess, or it's part of that whole thing. Um, but what's what's really interesting is um, this whole this whole line at the bottom, the flavor text. I was like, I'm glad you're staying. I was like, what does that mean? Well, let me read the lore. And so I read the lore, and it's all about um, Saint and him just you know basically being torn apart. Uh, of because Osiris, you know what happened to Osiris, and uh, it's really kind of a beautiful little lore story uh, that just shows how much he 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 cares, right? And we all know Saint Fourteen cares because he's you know <laughs> he's feeding pigeons over off in his corner forever, <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh, but he he's always wanted to be the protector, and so what does that have to do with the hus- hushed shrinks, right? So at first you think shrinks, so oh, that's some Egyptian, you know, pharaoh thing like a sphinx. Well, it's not. It's it has to do with birds. Um, a shrinx is the vocal organ of birds. It's located at the base of a, a bird's trachea that produces sounds. Uh, songbirds have evolved these organs by combining two unrelated pitches at once. Scientists believe this could have led to a silent period in the evolution of avian ancestors. Um, so, basically what that means is uh, a shrinx is, is the vocal organ which differs from mammals because it doesn't have the, the tissue and the vocal folds that we have so that we can talk or sing or, or you know, communicate. Mm-hmm. The sound is pro- produced from a vibration uh, in, a, in a membrane, which I'm not going to even butcher the scientific name for, but it's caused by the flowing of the air through that little sh- sh- uh, shrinx. Um, the shrinx. You keep calling yeah. it uh, syrinx, isn't it? Isn't it pronounced syrinx? Yes, syrinx. Because of that, the song. Yes. 
And so songbirds have evolved these specialized two-sided voice boxes, which allows them to perform unique sounds by combining two unrelated pitches at once. And here's where it's interesting. The voice box is one of a kind in the animal kingdom, and scientists have concluded that this voice box evolved only once, representing a rare example of the true evolutionary novelty. Uh, Reptiles, amphibians, and mammals all have a larynx, which is a voice box at the top of the throat that protects Mm -hmm. the airways. Um, That's like ours, you know, where we have folds of tissue that allow us to talk and make sounds. Uh, But birds also have larynxes as well. But the organ that they use to sing is lower down in the windpipe, uh, which splits into two lungs. So the Shrinks was named in 1872 after the Greek nymph chased by Pan in mythology, who was later transformed into Pan Pipes, the musical instrument made from a row of short pipes of varying length fixed together and played by blowing across the top. So if you ever think about a Pan flute, Mm-hmm. You know, it looks like a bunch of little hollow reeds all tied together and kind of like a, a cascading little flute. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's where this name came from. So it, it it's tied to the, the Pan story uh, in mythology and how he chased, you know, his lover or whatever. The Shrinx is thought to have possibly evolved to supplement sound production, which would have been followed by the loss of the larynx as a sound source. So this would have led to a whole entire silent period in the evolution of avian ancestors. So that means it was like this huge area uh, in evolution where just they didn't even make sound at all. Hmm. Uh, so current fossil records do not provide definitive evidence for whatever the function of the larynx was lost before the shrinx was gained. Uh, but that's very much how it, how it evolved. And so this, this novelty uh, became the thing that we hear all the time. So when you go outside and you hear a song uh, from a bird playing, it's not, you know, like a vocal thing. It's not like a a whistling through their beak. It's way down low. Mm -hmm. And it comes through that syrinx. (laughs) Um, So the cool thing about it was, is uh, it's neat because it has a duality to it. It talks about in the lore If you're reading the lore, he says in there, there's a line, and it's a very subtle line, and it has to do with their love and how they were quiet about it for so long. And he basically says in there, nice and perfectly stated in the paragraph, I will will no longer be silent, basically. Mm -hmm. And so it's neat because the, the item plays into this whole idea that Osiris and Saint never really were publicly loud about their love for one another or, Mm -hmm. you know, shared that like, Hey, we love each other, blah, blah, blah. And here he is feeling this somewhat moment of regret that he never was before. And now he's like, no more. I'm going to shout it to the, to the world, scream it and sing it to everybody Mm. that, you know, it's, it's nice. Yeah, I agree. So hushed shrinks. You now know why the Shrinx was hushed, hushed and you now know why it's the te- flavor text says, I'm glad you're staying. Because in the lore, he's like, I'm glad you're staying. I hope Osiris is all right. Because, I mean, that can kind of go, oh, uh, either way. You mean like he could die? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's very possible that he dies. Yeah, it is. It is very possible. And what would that do to Saint? We would, I think, we would need, I feel like it would be weird if Saint got a season, like if he became the um, focal point of a season, but he was yeah. still doing trials. So we yeah. would need someone to stand in for trials, whoever that could be. And then, I mean, yeah, I mean, doesn't one of the guys... Doesn't Crow take over trials right now? No. Does he? I thought he was helping with it. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't think he does. I haven't done I think trials somebody's helping. I think somebody's helping with trials right now. Well, I mean, like, physically in-game. Oh, yeah, but I know. But in the story, I think there's a, a dialogue mentioning 
somebody is helping with trials while mm. saying, because I think it's in that story. Maybe it's in that lore entry. Mm. Anyway. Somebody's well, I mean, I mean, like, well, like Saints. physically, physically have someone replace Saint fourteen, and then because if Osiris does die, the Saint is going to want to take that fight to Savathun, who's currently dead, but it's their ghost Imaru who is technically keeping Savathun alive. So just like Saint took the the um the Crusades against the Fallen, he would take his he would make an, a second Crusade against the lucent hive and and be on the search um, for amaru and i think that would be a really interesting season and i think if that season were to happen it would be next season instead of the last season right there's two more seasons we had we had season one we're in season two so there's two more yeah so i think it would happen in in season three of this year rather than season four of this year mm. because that's a good yeah. I think it would happen. I think he would he would like go on his crusade to get Amaru and all it would do is it would bring Amaru close to Savathun's body and then resurrect Savathun and she pieces out again. And it would be like you fucked up saint. Like it would be like a big dramatic moment for the final season to maybe be the final takedown of Savathun or maybe we end up realizing we do need to be allied with her. After all, you know, something like that. Right. Um, yeah. So we, you also wanted to talk about the third man, right? Yeah, I do. And I only want to mention that because um, we're experiencing a lot of trauma. <laughs> yeah. I know it's like the current meme to, to say like destiny is just full of trauma at the moment. <laughs> um, but I want to talk about Eris a little bit just because... The Mask of the Third Man was last week's uh, lore card, and I only brought it up because, you know, it it, it was a D1 thing. Um, and if you first look at Mask of the Third Man, the first thing you recognize is the three eyes. And, um, you know, Ares has three eyes, right? But they're mm -hmm. covered in a bandage, and you associate that with a hive and stuff like that. But this idea of the Third Man factor, I've, I've defined it a long time ago. But it's kind of taken on a new meaning now because with the nightmares and people dealing, our, our characters in the game dealing with their own tra trauma, uh, this has to do with the same kind of principle and idea. Uh, the third man factor is the sen sensation of an unseen presence, such as a guardian spirit, spirit providing support during a traumatic experience. Modern psychologists have used the third man factor to treat victims of trauma. Uh, several literary examples exist, such as T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, which is a great poem, by the way, if you ever want to read it. Um, but a few trivia pop references are tied to the, to, the, uh, to the item as well, which are just silly. But it's an amalgamation. So the quote on there is, it wasn't me, it was the third man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's an amalgamation of a, of a quote found in two different movies. The Mask, which, you know, Jim Carrey plays a goofy character that finds a a mask and he puts it on and he becomes like a brazen form of himself that he never was before. And then there, then the other movie was the fugitive, which is about somebody dealing with trauma and being chased the entire time. And it's not, he's not the individual that actually did something, but they're all chasing him. And he's just trying to say it. They both say it in the movie. It wasn't me. It was the one armed man. Right. <laughs> so the they quote also is, they also make that uh, that quote in uh, Stephen King's It. They do in the book, at least, yeah. Because at the, at the beginning of the book, and if if you ever go to read the book, it's very very graphic. It takes place in the fifties, and uh, basically, people didn't like uh, gay people, and they, I mean, they they went to throw him over a pier and not necessarily kill him. But yeah. they throw him over the pier, and that's where it is, and um, it takes a bite out of the the guy's like like upper chest area, and his uh -huh. his his boyfriend is like up on the pier, and is like, "What the fuck is happening?" And um, the all the guys are like, "It wasn't me, it was the clown." And then the 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 detective is like, "Yeah, it wasn't me, it was the one armed man. It's always it's oh, always someone yeah, yeah. else." Well, yeah, because it's a pop, it's a popular yeah. uh, quote from the old ass movie, uh, the original, The Fugitive, because mm -hmm. 
it was like a really, it's like one of those movies that solidified itself. It's like, you know, those quotes that you hear about. What are the hundred best quotes or most memorable quotes? It's yeah. like, frankly, Scarlet, I don't give a damn. Or I'm your father. Or, you know, all those things. Mm -hmm. And so this quote, uh, it wasn't me. It's, it was the third man is playing off of that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, like, yeah, it comes up in, in all kinds of other places, too. Uh but it was just funny because you have something called the mask of the third man, mask, and then you have the third man, mm -hmm. right? Which is really what the, the crux is of this uh, definition. The third man, so that particular item, when you were using Blade Dancer, it would help you basically be better at Blade Dancing. It uh, would, it would extend your timer, your super yeah. timer. You would get more health every time you killed somebody. Would you? I th think so. I thought it was only your super timer because that was like back when like super timers were just like a timer that ticked down and it was yeah. just, there you go. And that's so, all you get. Yeah. And yeah. you know, something that just increases that timer was kind of broken. Now we have, um, Raiden flux, which basically operates the same way for arc strider. Just it, it's like, yeah, every, every light attack kill you get when you do a heavy attack, you extend your timer. So it's like, yes. it makes you fight for it a bit more, I think. Okay, I, that's, okay, you're right. Weird. That's what it was. Yeah. So that's what this was doing. Mm -hmm. And so the third man is often described as an unseen being that intervenes at a critical moment when people are in great stress or in a life and death struggle. The mm -hmm. entity is believed to give comfort, aid, and or support. Um, while scientific research explains it, ha it as an internal component, Others believe it can be akin to a guardian angel or a physical manifestation brought forth via a transfusion of energy and instinctual wisdom from a seemingly external source where a presence appears. Um, and so I thought that was very interesting because uh, if you think about what's happening right now with the egregore and the nightmares, and it's the nightmares are like the opposite of the third band, but we turn those nightmares into memories. Mm -hmm. And those spirits are there. Um, we're taking those nightmares and we're flipping them into memories. And so the memories have, you know, like a, a, a fixed, purified version of themselves hanging above you. Which I'm really like, interested to see. Do you think Gaul is going to become purified and hang above, hang out? Because they're all hanging out <laughs> in, in the helm. Do you think Gaul is going to hang out in the helm and be our buddy? I hope not. <laughs> I don't think so. I think Keitel is going to destroy it. Yeah. Ooh, 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 ooh. Uh. So I brought up. I brought up this one. I only brought up. The only reason I brought up this one is because it almost feels like it ties all the way back to when Eris showed up. And oh. Eris is a is a product of, um, you know, she went through a lot of trauma. Mm -hmm. And in the in the um, dark below, the story talks about her being lost and how she found her way out, which we know now was the Ahamkara bone that, you know, she just basically wished and it's like, all of a sudden I know how they get out. But she was a very, she was a victim of trauma. And the whole time she's down there, uh, Tolan was trying to help. Well, I say help. Tolan was the guide for her. <laughs> See, I, and, used to, uh, I used to, until they explicitly said it, I used to hold on to the theory that the thing that she clutched that that orb that she has it people would say it was an ahamkara bone and i'm like until they explicitly say it i don't agree i held to the idea that it was a fragment of toland's ghost and that's why toland was guiding her you're talking about the orb itself yeah because that orb is her ahamkara bone that has finally been confirmed the thing she carries is the ahamkara bone Right. It's not a ghost fragment. I've said that like since since. Oh the dark yeah, below, yeah, though. yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And I always did too. We just never yeah. could say it like explicitly because yeah. we didn't have anything that defined it until not too yeah. long ago. Uh, not, but yeah, I, I was never that it couldn't have been an Amkara bone. It's just that I thought it would be more interesting if it were a fragment of Tolan's ghost. And oh, right everyone's on. like, oh, but she wished on an arm um, Kara bone. It's like, yeah, I can have both. Like, I, <laughs> I, I, you're like, I'm not not allowed to have a ghost fragment and an ahamkara that's bone. funny yeah well i guess if you look at a ghost when it you know splits out you know when you're dead it kind of looks like a floating orb anyway hmm. <laughs>
Anyway, I only brought that up because trauma is very much a part of what's going on right now. And Eris is the guide for us at the moment. And we're dealing with nightmares, which are very much physical manifestations of mm-hmm. a trauma event. Yeah. So bring back um, the third man and make it red. Speaking of the third man and making it red, it was what was it? If you were if your character was male, the eyes were blue, and if your character was female, the eyes were green. Yes. That was a weird thing that they coded in. Yeah. And remember how Celestial Nighthawk, the eyes glue when you were aiming down sights? No, it's when it's when you have your super active. Oh, was it when your super was active? No, because actually maybe that was a holdover because when Celestial Nighthawk was first debuted, it wasn't actually a super thing. It just gave you like increased in-air accuracy and then they tuned it to be, makes your, condenses your golden gun to 6x damage. To one shot. So maybe in D1 it was when you were aiming down sights because that's what it was. Yeah, I just remember when we would aim down sights at each other on the moon, we could see the eyes glow. It was cool. That's interesting, yeah. Yeah. Um, But so... And this book um, is is a very uh, to get into the book because we've been here for an hour now. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's well, it's only short. It's not like it's not like a it's not like an insanely elaborate yeah. book. It like just deals yeah. with the straight ups. And and we've already kind of heard this story in season of the Risen. Yeah. I there's too many names. I cannot keep I track know. of the names. The I only know. thing I have a harder time than keeping track of the names is keeping track of the numbers. And that's why it is called it season <laughs> one, two, three, and four. And it's the only way I will ever keep track of this. Season one of Witch Queen, uh Saladin kind of goes over this story and we get that like really cool line art cut scene. And this is just more of the 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 hard details of it. And it's only four entries, but they are like lengthy entries. They are they are thick entries. Normally we'll have a book be like 10 entries long and it'll be like 15, 16 pages. This is four entries right. and it's 13 pages. So. Right. And the, <laughs> and it's because they're it's because they're immersing you into the story so that yeah. you kind of get lost into the environment because the environment is really where they're telling the story to you. Yeah. Um, but mm-hmm. the key the key things to note are just like the meat and potatoes that we've all kind of learned uh you yeah. know going into into the story so far yeah and so i'll i'll run us through it really quick if there's anything sure. that you want to um point out in the book there's a few things i want to point out in the book yeah uh, feel free to jump in so the first entry is uh violent tributaries and so like rhino was saying it's all about the like location so the iron lords operated out of Fellwinter's peak which i believe was in a russian cosmodrome relative area so general location on the eastern edge of russia um right. and we know that because of the um the observatory mm-hmm. the, which was the tetter uh observatory but yeah anyway russia and and so so saladin here is on the outskirts of their territory because they basically claimed an iron lord safe zone if you were within this safe zone you were under the iron law but they only have so many iron lords they can't actually cover the whole world although that is their goal they 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 plan to cover the whole world and protect everyone from warlords but so saladin is out tracking a signal on the outskirts of town and outskirts of their region when he's um he's attacked we don't know what happened in the attack but basically he wakes up impaled on a branch and out over the ridge uh enemies are and they're starting to like take shots at him but they're terrible shots they're not really connecting and um he he's trying to pull himself off of the branch and he like he yells at his ghost to come out and and just like take him off the branch and his ghost is like you're not dead yet you can you can get out of this you need to learn how to um you need to learn how to do things without just relying on on me yeah baby bird syndrome yeah and uh and so he ends up pulling himself off but so there is a line here where it says Radagast had warned him of risen thugs fleeing to the far wilds to escape the iron lord's reach and so 
I can't remember if it was an interview, if it was just like a Twitter conversation, if it was a conversation that I had with an author, but back in D1 and, and, and you look at rise of iron or not rise of iron, you look at the dark below and you look at, uh, house of wolves. And even you look at taken King destiny, wasn't trying to put the characters in the focal point. We were supposed to be the focal point, which is so yeah, different right. from how it is now. Yeah. Like we literally have three weeks of Crow's trauma or uh, Zavala's trauma, Keitel's trauma. We've had series of Eris's trauma. And when she debuted in Dark Below, it's like, yeah, I'm fucked up. Let's get going. You know, it's it doesn't know. <laughs> it doesn't really get into it. <laughs> but and it was because that was that was intentional. Like um, yeah. John Goff actually said. And again, I'm sorry, I can't remember where he said it. He he doesn't think that we should ever actually meet Jaron Ward in the game. He's kind of like holding on to that old that old logic of like they're they're the past, we're the future. We should be the right. focus. Sure. But, but so Destiny Lore comes out and they talk about Jaron Ward and they talk about Dredge and Yor and they talk about Osiris and they talk about Saint Fourteen and everyone's like, I can't wait to meet them. And right. he's like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, yeah. years later, we get Rise of Iron. We start to learn about the history of the Iron Lords and get more involved with them. And then we get Destiny 2. And very quickly, we get Curse of Osiris and we get Warmind yeah. and we get all, we get Anna Bray back. We get Osiris back. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, like that Insane was. Insane 14 back. Yeah, that came much later, but yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's exactly what it is. It was like they kind of set out to not give us characters. They wanted us to be the focal point. But people, yeah. no, we want the characters. And then they're like, okay, I guess we're doing the characters. And and that's kind of where we are today. And I just, yeah. I think it's much better, personally. Yeah. Yeah, I, get, I agree. The Exo Stranger, mm -hmm. I mean, another my one. God. In and out. Yeah. She was gone. She had no yeah. point being there because she wasn't the focus. Bray. Yeah. <laughs> She wasn't, the you know, it, it's just like, it's is. like all the figures that we, we were obsessed by mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, you, you're very, you're making a very good point. It was like all the figures that we were obsessed by and just couldn't let go. And we're like, we have to know more. We have to know more. And those are all the pinnacle, like those are all the top of the, the story, mm -hmm. uh, characters. So I can kind of understand. Yeah. And so then throughout this, um, as he's trying to get off of this tree uh it says uh light condenses into saladin's fingers arc lines fork across the bark as he grips the branch impaled through his shoulder so he so this is very this is dark age light um uh light manipulation and later on uh saladin conjures waning starfire from his bones the last vestiges of his will burnt as offering to the light Flame billows and radiates through his flesh, swirling the gaps in his armor, moving to consume the branch. And then a little bit later yeah. on, as <clears throat> fingers find hilt, the solar light engulfs the weapon. He swings the axe from its strap and sinks the flaming blade into the tree, slowing the descent and carving a wake of sparking embers toward the forest floor. So yeah. two things on this are like big for me because it's it's 2022 and people still think that guardians only have one subclass and i that, know what is that about it drives I don't me never know it's like people were always like oh saladin's only a uh back in the day saladin or not saladin a uh, zavala was only a, a void a whatever titan. defender yeah void titan yeah yeah and then and then um yeah it didn't make any sense no uh, Cora was i did none of it made sense yeah <laughs> And it was like they they with Taken King when we got the Void Hunter and we got the Solar Titan and we got the Arc yeah. Warlock, yeah. it kind of muddied that water a bit because it was like, you know, Cade said, um, when we go to take the Dusk Bow off of Tevis Larson, Cade's like, not all hunters can hold it because they're afraid of the void. And it's like, okay. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. technically speaking, any hunter can wield the Dusk Bow. It's just yeah. are they capable of doing it? And right, then, exactly. The same thing with Ikora teaching us how to harness the arc, uh, uh, Stormcaller, where it's like, yeah, you're basically passing lightning through your body. You're the f you're a fucking firebender right now. Yeah. And it's it's dangerous. Conjurer. Yeah. Yeah. And then for Sunbreakers, it was like, yeah, it used to be super popular. Like here is Saladin. Exactly. 
using solar flames and it's like yeah, but, it wasn't, but because of the yeah. banished sunbreakers nobody wanted to use it out of yeah like uh, yeah the titans yeah specifically didn't want to use it yeah I, I i thought it was always silly like that people would be like oh they can only do the one thing mm-hmm. it never made sense no they can do whatever they want to do they just they have their reasons because remember in um in I think it was in Taken King when we're going into Cade's stash, there was like arc grenades or something, and I was like, "Oh, he's arc. He's, yeah. he's an arc <laughs> hunter." And I'm like, "They're grenades. They're not even a super. They're yeah. just fucking well, grenades." If had read if people had read all the bounty dialogue and flavor text mm-hmm. from all the missions and stuff, there were tons of stories of 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 you know hunters doing blade dancer stuff and golden gunslinger mm-hmm. stuff. And then later on, void stuff. And then same with the warlocks and the titans. You know, it yeah. was like there was never it was never explicitly stated that any one particular subclass was tied to only two or just one yeah. class. Let and alone I'll, our vendors be that way. And obviously, everyone, even us, we have our preferences. We have the yeah. ones that we like the most. We have the ones that we use the most, and etc. Yeah. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But it, it doesn't make sense to have the mentor be like imagine if Cade was like oh sorry you, you want to do solar yeah. hunter no i'm I can only I, teach you how to be a gunslinger <laughs> i don't i don't know how to do that other shit man yeah but but i'm the only one here so you're screwed right. we're not gonna have one well, each and then that's the other thing that's the good thing that what came about in dt d2 is it kind of explained that um old light bearers mm-hmm. um you know they didn't have like their their specific um it wasn't refined it? yeah there you go it wasn't like they were it wasn't like they were saying okay i'm gonna walk this path in line and now mm-hmm. i'm gonna become a titan or a hunter or a warlock that came mm-hmm. later mm-hmm. like the the old school uh light bearers were just starting to discover those paths yeah and and this Entry here is a great example of it. As Fingers finds Hill and Solar Light engulfs the weapon, he swings the axe. So he's not he's not doing a hammer of soul, which is just a physical hammer that they still right. just engulf the weapon with. And then you look right. at striker, striker titans, they just punch the ground. And defenders yeah. are the ones that are actually doing something interesting where it's like forming something with light, but it's right early light manipulation and you can also see this in um the book uh man with no name in the chapters where drifter is going by the name germain he physically burned someone to death they were already almost that's dead. right but he yeah, like burned right. someone to death just pulsing the energy from his hand and it's like yeah. this very early dark age light manipulation where it's basically just like untethered exertion you know it's there's, there's no there's no control over it. It's it's very just you get what you get out of it. Fire burns, right. arc pulses, you know, like. Right. Yeah. So like they came it. a long way. Um, And that was probably one of the biggest entries in this book. Most of the other entries are just going to be the story. <laughs> so that's going to be like one of our only stopping points. Uh, entry two is Wake. Uh, Saladin yeah. killed his attackers. He shot a rocket at them, and his ghost, uh, Azira, considers it a draw. Like when he goes there and he sees the bodies, he's like, "I did it, I won." And Azira's like, "No, it's a draw because you know they're just humans, and it took you all of this just to kill them. So you don't get to call that a victory." Um, and as he's as he's looking at the bodies, um, a human a human comes out. Uh, a human named, I forgot the name and I didn't write it down, uh, Jeopardy or something like that. I'm sorry. Kepri. It's okay. <laughs> uh, a human named Kepri comes out after hearing the explosion. He comes out to investigate the scene and uh, Saladin's kind of like, you're here to look for bodies like you're you're eating human meat and he's like no no i'm looking for weapons because you know i got to protect my village and occasionally when people die there's shitty weapons left behind but a weapon's a weapon <laughs> and um he he basically begs uh zavala to come back to this or uh, saladin to come back to the city and he agrees uh he goes back to their town and um elmi was a pig 
uh, specifically a sow. Is that a female pig sow? Yeah. Uh, and it was their only female pig, which is a big deal because if you have a female pig, you can have piglets and you can have a food supply. But if you only have one female pig and someone steals it, your food supply is hey, gone. You're screwed. Yeah. yeah. You only have a little bit. Yeah. So you only have what you have and you're not making any more. And so, um, it was a big deal for the town that someone stole their pig. And so Saladin agrees to, to go after whoever, whoever stole it. And so he, he hunts down the pig and that's, that's where we're getting into entry three, uh, plea deal. And so Saladin and Isariah, <clears throat> excuse me, find the thief's base, but all there is is a small girl, and uh, this girl's name is Farah, and she threatens to kill Saladin, and and she only, she actually has knowledge about like about Risen, and she's like, uh, I know I'll kill your. She calls uh, the ghost a demon. And she's like, I'll kill yeah. your demon so it doesn't bring you back. I know they give you magic powers, right? And Saladin just like dares her. He's like, Yeah, fucking do it. And so yeah. she moves her gun over to Isariah. And Saladin blocks the shot, which I think is actually pretty interesting because there's a bit of a contention over what can and can't kill a guardian's ghost. And this weapon, which can only take one shot before it needs to be reloaded, think uh, No Land Beyond, was apparently enough because Saladin blocked the shot. Yeah. I, I can't imagine him giving a shit if it wouldn't have done anything. Um, well... Yeah, and and so this particular uh, human also had some bad dealings with other light bearers in the past, obviously yes. because you know it's calling the ghost a demon and yeah. knows to kill. <laughs> yeah, knows light to kill coming in. Yep. Yeah, and so that that light bearer was the warlord named Jackson, and so Jackson apparently took Farah's brother and promised to give him back to her if she were to go around and get him treasures. And so right. she got a, she stole a whole bunch of shit, including the pig, Emmy, Emily, Elmy, Emmy, 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 Elmy. I think, Elmy. Yeah, Elmy, which is a weird name okay. for a pig. Um, trust me, I would know. Uh, this game loves to mention pigs, <laughs> by the way. Does it? Well, yeah. How many other pigs has it mentioned? Well, we know about the pig <laughs> in the Clovis Bray story. Ugh. <laughs> Is, I didn't want to remember that man. <laughs> anyway, uh, but so Saladin asks if Jackson told the truth, and he looks at this like stash of of things, and within that stash is a child wrapped up in sheets. So yeah, Jackson brought uh, Farah's brother back, but he brought him back dead. So right, that's crazy. And so. Saladin agrees to go after Jackson on behalf of, of Farah. And so as they're making their way, it's a few, it's a few days of walking as they're making their way. Saladin shows her how to hunt and talks to her about how, when you do things for a community, it keeps you sane. And it's like the, the wolf who's alone is just a savage They're The, 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 all they know is, is hunger right. and they're just hunting yeah. to eat. And that's bad. Right. And, you know, it's, it's, it's the a, strength of the pack. Yeah, which all obviously falls in place with the Iron Lord, Iron Wolves idea, and all that. Yep. And so yep. he's trying to like bring her back from the path that she's on, and um, so she hunts and he cooks the meat by holding it in his hands and <laughs> firing it. Yeah, <laughs> which is pretty interesting and disgusting. But yeah. I don't think I'd want that meat. It's like, mmm, from fresh from your hand. <laughs> well, I mean, it conflagrates anything that was bad. So. I guess. I don't I mean, think ash I'd want is ash. It, it, ash is ash. You know, whether it was something gross or not, it's all carbon at that point. I guess. I, I, I'm not a fan of it, though. But so they make it to uh, Jackson's compound and they have a camp outside and uh, Saladin tells Farrah to stay. He goes in and just kills everyone. But Farrah didn't yeah. stay at the camp. She came and watched him kill, savagely yeah, kill these people. Yeah. And that's probably traumatic. Well, I mean, she was kind of happy about it. Yeah. But think about it, though, like her 
her what did they call that uh bloodlust was born mm -hmm. anyway yeah i mean it, it was traumatic in 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 this way um pharaoh rubs her talisman when the warlord jackson emerges amethyst light surrounding him so void light uh yeah a moment of fear creeps into her heart as Jackson bellows laughter and charges, but he too falls under an obliterating column of lightning called down by Saladin's thunderous roar. All that remains is the crackle of his cindered bones and flaking into ash. So you'd eat that? Well, I mean, it's ash. Ash is ash. You'd eat that? What's the grossest thing that you will not eat? Like food wise, like the, if you go to a restaurant and you say, "I don't want any of this," what is it? There's a few things that I can't eat, like okay, texture wise. I hate, I hate bell peppers and yes. raw onions. Yeah. Okay. So well, I will not, not eat that. Onions. But if you if I you burned it, if you burned it to straight up just ash, and it was like, you know, somewhere on my pork chop, mm -hmm. I wouldn't mind. I I I I will immediately throw up if I if I eat something that has a uh, cucumber if I eat the cucumber really? that, yeah immediately uh, bad uh shrimp unless it is shrimp? unless it is butterfly butterfly scrimps I cannot eat it oh wow um, it's 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 a texture thing it's just immediate okay um, sure and I I hate bell peppers I I agree yeah, with I, that. I love peppers, peppers. I love sulfur, peppers I peppers are amazing Bell peppers yeah. suck. Bell um, peppers are the gross. Bell peppers are an abomination. You know the bell pepper was made, so they basically took a pepper and took all the hotness out of it, and we're like, bell pepper, here you go. Fuck you. You know what? I know exactly. Pisses, you take you know, all the crappy parts of a pepper and you present it as a new thing. It tastes like gasoline. First of all, <laughs> it's it's fucking vile, and people <laughs> have people have the nerve. To insist that bell peppers belong on a cheesesteak. Nothing fucking They don't belong mad. on the cheesesteak. They don't belong in pizzas. They don't belong, they don't belong in spaghetti or oh. any Italian food, honestly. When, when, they, when people make, a, a, whether you call it American chop suey or goulash, they put bell they peppers in it. They put bell peppers in it. Why? It ruins it. I know. That, oh, my it's God. It's because it's green and it adds color and you think you're getting something. And because most people who like bell peppers... What do they say about him? The, what do they say about him? Oh, it doesn't really taste like anything. <laughs> then don't. Well, eat why it. do you want? It? Don't why eat. do you need it? <laughs> anyway, sorry. People suck. <laughs> <sighs> what were we talking about? Uh, forget. We we're talking about um, the sucky world. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Saladin kills kills Jackson's men and. Isariah is like, all right, now you got to kill the kid too because they committed yeah. two two death offenses. They stole and they attacked an Iron Lord, specifically their ghost. And Saladin's like, mm -hmm. no, I can see, uh, you know, she she's not gonna go down that path. Like right. we we'll salvage the batter or um, yeah, we can we can fix her. Yeah. It, she, she we we've, we've taught her the error of her way she's going to go back yeah, to town yeah she's learning it'll be yeah. fine but he it's so naive of him to not it recognize is. that she's you know learning this bloodlust but there is a part of me that wonders because so she did walk away from that and like did try to adhere to his lessons because so then entry 4 it's 50 years in the future. He go Saladin is sent back to Jeffrey's village because there yep. were rumors of rabid wolves prowling around. And right. I say it that way. If you're not watching, I did air quotes. Um, I say it that way because this entry, it's like, it's like a mission report written by Saladin and Saladin needs to pull his head out of his ass and not just call things wolves for the sake of calling them wolves <laughs> when he's talking about fucking humans. And right. It's, it's so confusing. Um, right. but so he arrives and the town is basically dead. Humans are being burnt. There's graves, there's chaos. And he, he, he goes further into town and he finds Farah, an old woman now sitting on a throne constructed of like junk. And she has wolves on either side of him, uh, her, yeah. by which he means she has two men on either side of her and her other wolves are out hunting and, he means people. Yeah. 
<laughs> I know because people were like, "Oh, the Iron Wolves were a part of this," and yeah, I know it, it drove a lot of confusion. Which is only worse because the Iron Wolves are the Iron Lords, which is another thing that I'm so I know. hung and up on. And then the Wolves was getting. a derogatory term term that they adopted yeah. as a yeah. I know, I know. Mm-hmm. And then we have the freaking Fallen Wolves, House of Wolves. It's like stop Bungie. with the wolves, please. Yeah. We were an Iron Wolf, but nobody remembers. Yeah, and then but they do here, remember. Even here, he says he says in the in the last entry, where the hell is it? He he says something about uh, he says something about how how kicking a wolf or something is bad as as justification for not killing Farah as a child. And it's like, yeah. yeah, well, kicking a wolf is bad when you can make it an ally. And it's like, but you're not. You're letting it. You're you're just letting it go after right. doing all that stuff. Yeah. So of course it turned yeah. bad. But yeah, so, exactly. So Farah did listen to him though, as a child. Farah and she she tells him all this. Farah went back to the village and tried to like foster this community there. And they were like, oh, you're the thief, and they cut her fucking ear off. Yeah. And so she's like, fuck this. Yeah. There was never mind. And there's like a part of me that's like, well, I kind of get it. (laughs) If I was, if I was fed that lie about community and I try to go back to the community and they cut my ear off, even though I bring the pig (laughs) with me. Yeah. And so like, you got to wonder like, what was she really kind of uh, enamored by? Was it the power or the sense of, uh, you know, security in, yeah. I like this whole story because it somewhat plays with um, like gang mentality a little Mm -hmm. bit. And uh, I grew up, I grew up in a lot of hard um, areas when I was young and, you know, and so I'm not going to talk about the trauma in my life, but I know firsthand some of the experiences and the allure of wanting to be a part of a group or a collective or a gang Mm-hmm. And I know the pitfalls that that happen within that. And one of the things that is that is, let's say you're a part of a group and it's a gang. And if you have that comfort and that protection, all is good. But once you branch out on your own, you try, you know, to do what your own thing, you walk yeah. into the wrong territory or even come back into your own where you were, you know, not no longer protected by the 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 group you had. Mm-hmm. You're 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 you get torn apart, yeah. and so what Saladin, I think Saladin's lesson from all of this was that you can't you can't temporarily be a mentor. You're always you always have to be a mentor. Mm-hmm. It's like in Star Wars, you know, to bring into another sci-fi uh, story. If you have a Padawan, you know, that becomes Darth Vader, he's still your Padawan, right? He's still your, you're still his mentor, regardless of what that person came to be. It's just how was that in that person all along to begin with? Did you recognize that? Did you help foster it? Did you mm-hmm. help uh, protect them? Were you there when they needed you most to guide them uh, safely and positively through the traumatic events of their life? Or did you just leave them to their own devices when you should have probably been there for them and stuff like yeah. that? Like, so that's the whole wrestling with. Like, you know, you can't just like temporarily help somebody. You can't just see somebody on the street and say, oh, here's a quarter. That only gets them so far. You know, you, if you really want to help somebody, you got to take them and give them the tools to better themselves and bring themselves into a better situation. Yada, yada, yada. Whether that's mental or physical. Yeah, and no, you're, so, you're completely right. Uh, and yeah. and I think he took that lesson, and he kept that lesson in with uh, Shaxons and Zavala. Yeah, because he and he, see that's one of the problems that Saladin and Shax had with one yeah. another is because their viewpoints were very different. Saladin was, you know, a hardened, uh, you know, they were both they were both lords, <laughs> warlords. Uh, well, but, Shax was a warlord. You know, Saladin was. Yeah, that's warlord. what I mean. Yeah, so they were both like Shax was a warlord. Yeah. Saladin was an Iron Lord. Saladin was trying to write basically the script that is our new, our mentors and our, you know, whatever, the structure. And then Shax was like, bro, this is like not what you think it is. This is all hell is breaking loose. We got to annihilate things. And mm-hmm. anyway, so they butt heads on a lot of stuff. Yeah. Because there's a little bit of a different viewpoint on how to lead. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're, you're, you're right there as well. Um, 
And and basically, Saladin came in and saw saw his mistake, and and he fifty years too late uh, righted his wrong, and he ended up killing uh, Farah. Uh, yeah. He did. He didn't leave unharmed, and um, so he's he's pretty fucked up at at, at the end of it. Um, and yeah, Zariah is is Zyra is Zyra. Float. It's hard. It's hard to pronounce, and I try to do it right. As Ira floats near the settlement's fence, a small shadow against early morning sun piercing through snow flurries. Saladin climbs the distance to her before she heals his wounds. The journey. The journey is a purifying penance. He tells himself, "Pain yeah. he can abide." So right. as Ira is very much like, yeah, you kind of like how uh, we we recently heard the story about. Or in triage, we'll, we'll cover this eventually. But like, um, uh, Zavala was just like, "I'm a guardian. I don't need to feel pain. I have a ghost. They they heal me up every time." And when yeah. he got he got cut, Safi's like, "No, you don't get to have your ghost heal you and not right. deal with healing yourself. Right. You are getting bandaged. You are getting stitches, and you are taking this the slow way, so you know what you're right. leading humans into." Exactly. Yeah, you can't speak or do things if you don't experience them in some way for yourself. Like, you yeah. can't speak on something you know nothing about. Yeah. And uh, that's the end of the book, which it was a very good book. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a good book. And uh, our next show will be on the 10th, July 10th. Nice. So July 10th will be our next show. We will have the conclusion of the Sever missions, which is interesting because usually the last mission is like way at the end of the season. And then I guess they're not going to do that this time. So I wonder what else is going to happen at the end of the season. If anything is going to happen at the end of the season, I wonder if they're going to like tease the season next or if they're going to keep it completely hidden again. There's so, there's so much that we don't know. Um, Yeah. There's a lot to unpack. We'll definitely know something by net by next show though. Yeah. And next week, uh, maybe we'll do a season of the haunted lore book. Maybe we'll keep it back in season of the risen because there's all this, sh- uh, not shadow keep uh, witch queen lore that we haven't actually gotten into either. So there's a yeah. lot to pick from. If you really want to push us on, on a book, as long as it is fully accessible in the API, just for my ease, as long as it's fully accessible within the API at us at loose cannon show, same way it's spelt there. Tell us you want yep. us to read that book, one of the the recent books that we haven't done, or even an old book that we haven't done. If if we we missed one of your favorites, um, let us know, and we uh, yep. will accommodate sooner or later. Uh, so yeah, July tenth. Uh, is that it? That's it. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye.